I'm Dr. Shannon Zank, Director of the National Institute of Nursing Research. I'm excited to welcome you to the third NINR Director's Lecture of 2021. Thank you for joining us for today's lecture from Dr. Mi Kyung Son, addressing one of the most enduring challenges in healthcare, end of life decision making. One of the many important lessons we've learned as we've navigated this pandemic together is the value of adaptability. And just one of the ways we're continuing to harness that adaptability is by using this virtual platform to deliver Dr. San's lecture. We do, of course, look forward to returning to the NIH campus to host these lectures when it's safe to do so. But until then, we're hoping all our colleagues around the country are staying safe and healthy. The NINR Director Lecture Series brings researchers from across the nation who are advancing nursing science in significant ways to share their work and interests with a transdisciplinary audience. NINR has long supported research that works to improve the health of individuals, families, and communities. Now more than ever, we see the need for more knowledge, better health care, and informed policy to improve our nation's health. We're committed to funding nursing science that will solve our nation's most pressing health problems and most stubborn health inequities by collaboratively taking nursing science to new levels. Collaboration between nursing and other fields is one of the ways to solve these health issues. With that, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Mi Gyeong Son. Dr. Son is a tenured professor, the Edith F. Honeycutt Chair in Nursing and the Director of the Center for Nursing Excellence and Palliative Care at Emory University School of Nursing. Her research is focused on palliative and end-of-life care, including advanced care planning, treatment decision-making, family caregiving, symptoms, and families' post-bereavement outcomes. Dr. Son also leads an NINR-funded intervention trial that evaluates the effectiveness and implementation outcomes of SPIRIT, sharing patients' illness representation to increase trust an advanced care planning intervention she developed that helps prepare patients facing end-stage renal disease and their caregivers for end-of-life decision-making. The project titled An Effectiveness Implementation Trial of SPIRIT in ESRD is funded through 2022. So thanks so much for joining us. Please uh, help me in welcoming Dr. Song. Oh, thank you so much. Nearly 40 years of intensive work to improve end-of-life care has shown that aligning care with patients' needs and preferences is surprisingly difficult. Um, I don't know if you have seen this editorial. Uh, this came out shortly after 2014 NAMS report entitled Dying in America. My main program research is focused on this enduring challenge in healthcare to develop and test an intervention for patients and their families to prepare for treatment decision-making at the end of life. It involved a series of pilot RCTs to gain a good understanding of every aspect of the intervention when targeted a certain patient population and the care setting to prepare for a full-scale efficacy trial followed by a pragmatic trial in a real world setting and pilot RCTs again. And I'll take you through this journey in the next 30 minutes. Um, if you put these three landmark reports side by side, deciding to forego life-sustaining treatment, approaching death, and then dying in America, you will quickly realize that things have not changed much over the past 40 years. And many researchers and policymakers had to turn to advanced directives to improve the matter. And in fact, there have been nearly 2,000 advanced directives and advanced care planning related studies, but very few of them demonstrated positive outcomes, particularly for the patients and family outcomes. 
So this skepticism over advanced directives, or I call it uh, advanced care planning fatigue, is not new. In 2004, uh, there was a review paper entitled Enough, the Failure of the Living Well. And then a recent editorial, Advanced Directives slash Care Planning, Clear, Simple, and Wrong. And these papers uh, well reflected the skepticism. This is a caricature showing bloodletting practice in the early 19th century. Are advanced directives a bad idea? Just like a bloodletting that once seemed plausible, but the course of wisdom was to be renounced. I would say not quite. I think equating uh, completing advanced directives with advanced care planning is the problem. The over-reliance on legal documents without conducting the necessary good conversations with the patient and family, I think that is to be renounced rather than advanced care planning altogether. People desire simple, concrete, and quick fix, and this tendency is very difficult to reverse. Uh, perhaps conducting good, serious illness discussions is never simple. But as an uh, Italian historian puts it, there are no simple solutions to complex problems. To talk about end of life decision making with the patients and family members, we must visit their illness trajectories. Now you probably have come across this graph showing the illness trajectory or functional declining common in end stage uh, end organ failures. You may recall the paper on functional declines across uh, main chronic illnesses was published in JAMA 2003, uh, first authored by Dr. June Looney, um, a former NINR program officer. I overlaid these three sets of advanced care planning outcomes. Um, and this is how I conceptualize advanced care planning and its outcomes. And you can also, uh, look at the mechanism of intervention as well. This line of my research has shown that the immediate outcomes of advanced care planning should be focused on patient and surrogate's preparedness for end of life decision making, by which there are later outcomes, including post bereavement outcomes after the patient's death can be improved. But patients and their family decision makers, or I call, uh, I'll call them uh, surrogate decision makers, are often unprepared for end of life decision making. That is, uh, decades of research has shown that patients and surrogates are unaware of the patient's illness progression. It is difficult to see what's down the road, and they focus on one day at a time. And this is why often just simply conveying prognostic uh, information may not be necessarily helpful. And surrogates lack the intimate knowledge of a patient's wishes. They often do not know what is acceptable to their loved one when it comes to end of life uh, treatment and what is not. And the surrogates are uh, unprepared for decision-making during emotional turmoil. What it would be like to make critical decisions under a very stressful situation and often without much time. In this picture, a young girl is rehearsing. She checks out the stage where the spotlights are. What it'd be like to be on stage how trembling it might be, can I remember my lines, and so on. I think advanced care planning should be an opportunity to provide the patient and family, particularly for the surrogate decision maker, a mental rehearsal for end of life decision making. But many people miss the opportunity until it's too late or never have the opportunity. But research in psychology has shown that when emotionally distressed, people choose a default option as a coping mechanism, and the choice may have nothing to do with their preferences. 
Much of the preparedness construct in my research has been informed by a disaster literature. A historian, Scott Knowles, who is a specialized in disaster, created the term slow disaster. Unlike a fast disasters such as earthquakes or hurricanes, we tend to get those a lot these days. Slow dis disaster refers to the accretion of harm from incremental neglect or deferred maintenance, which ultimately leads to a fast disaster. We often believe we have time when in fact we don't. I think this is a good analogy for not having advanced care planning that can prepare for end of life decision-making leading to disastrous harm for the patient and the lifelong distress or trauma for the family. So spirit uh, sharing patients illness representations to increase the trust is an approach to preparing patients and families for end of life decision making. In spirit, a clinician uses a theory based structured intervention guide and this guide includes a set of prescribed questions that the clinician must explore with the patient and the surrogate to make the discussion effective. SPIRIT targets both patients and surrogates as it aims at preparedness and not completion of a document. As shown in this picture, it is a face-to-face -face meeting format and is designed for outpatient care settings. The guiding theory is called representational approach to patient education. Uh, according to this theory, People have their own understanding and beliefs about their illness or symptom experience. And this understanding or beliefs may or may not be medically correct, but it is critically important to explore the person's representations first, because those understanding and beliefs serve as a mental framework that determines whether the person accepts new information or rejects it. And such exploration also uh, serves as an opportunity for the individual to reflect their own ideas and also recognize any gaps or concerns. Then the clinician uh, can provide individualized information to fill the gap or address concerns. And the person is more likely to accept the new information without much resistance. So this theoretical model fits well in the setting of conducting an end-of-life discussion with the people with a chronic condition and their family caregiver who typically do not want to talk about it. Spirit sessions are conducted along uh, the, the six steps. And step one is assessing patient and surrogate's illness representations and asking both the patient and the surrogate about how the patient's illness has affected their life, for example. And this first step is the most important step of all because it creates a foundation for the next steps and naturally leads to later steps to discuss likely end of life situations. Dr. Sandy Ward, um, who developed the representational approach with Dr. Heidi Donovan, has been instrumental throughout this 18-year journey of SPIRIT trials. So let me uh, talk about SPIRIT trials. Uh, the first one is um, early 2000, uh, many clinicians uh, tried to avoid end-of-life discussion with their patients because um, they were concerned that uh, such discussion would raise patients and or their families' uh, anxiety and might undermine this relationship with their patients. Uh, this randomized control trial was to uh, address just that. So what would be a better population than major surgical patients and their families to test whether talking about end of life wishes would increase their anxiety? I was young and brave at the time. Um, the study enrolled 32 patients who were undergoing open heart surgery and their family members as pairs. Um, this graph is showing the effect sizes of study outcomes. 
The study demonstrated that the intervention improved the diet congruence, meaning that it helped the patient articulate um, his or her wishes and also help the surrogate understand them so they can be on the same page and did so without causing uh, much difficulties for the patient, uh, which is shown here as DCS, Decisional Comfort Scale Scores. And importantly, uh, having such a conversation before their major surgery did not raise the state anxiety for the patient or surrogate. But unfortunately, the 32 diets were all whites and, and therefore the intervention effects on other racial uh, ethnic groups were unknown. So we, did, uh, we conducted a pilot RCT with African-Americans. To reach out to more African-Americans, we targeted the end-disease renal population. Um, as you know, ESRD is never a single disease but a family of a multiple chronic conditions that affect more than 700,000 people in the US. And these people do require a renal replacement therapy. And blacks are about three to four times more likely than whites to develop end stage kidney disease. According to a recent CDC report, more than 240 people on dialysis die every day. So in, in this small pilot study, um, we observed that the diet congruence improved after intervention, but other study outcomes, including patients with decisional conflict, uh, it did not. And, but study participants taught us how we could improve the intervention for the target of population. We identified several areas of intervention for modifications to make it more appropriate for Blacks on dialysis. And of those, two major areas were that the first step of the intervention, exploring illness representations, should include spiritual representations related to their illness and life-sustaining treatment. And also in later steps, uh, addressing the likely end of life decision-making situation, and those need to be more specific uh, to dialysis population. Um, that is, it wasn't so much about whether to start uh, or undergo aggressive procedures because they are already uh, living on dialysis, uh, a life-sustaining treatment. So rather it was important to have a conversation about living on dialysis and when it would be appropriate to consider stopping dialysis. So in the next RCT, we tested the modified intervention with the 58 blacks on dialysis and their surrogate decision makers. Uh, this time we looked at uh, longer term outcomes, including the preparedness outcomes at three months. And those outcomes included diet congruence, patient's decisional conflict, and surrogate decision-making confidence. And we also interviewed the bereaved family members after uh, the patient's death. Um, during this study, we observed an interesting phenomenon. The majority of the participating surrogates felt confident about knowing the patient's wishes and their role uh, and responsibility as a surrogate. And yet, only less than 30% correctly predicted their loved one's wishes at the baseline. Um, in other words, surrogates are, in general, overly optimistic about their ability to serve as a surrogate without knowing that they, in fact, do not know their loved one's wishes. So we created a composite outcome that combines diet congruence and surrogate decision-making confidence. So in this, uh, as this graph shows, um, the intervention uh, and then control groups difference, we found that the intervention improved the composite outcome from baseline to two weeks. And the intervention in fact is sustained three months after the intervention. So based on what we had learned from uh, those pilot trials, we conducted a full scale efficacy trial. 
So we enrolled 210 diets of patients with uh, end-stage renal disease and their chosen surrogate decision makers from uh, 20 dialysis clinics that cover eight counties in North Carolina. And 67 of the sample were uh, blacks. So we evaluate the intervention effects and preparedness outcomes all the way up to 12 months. And also we uh, looked at the surrogates post bereavement outcomes measured at uh, two weeks after the patient's death. And then we wanna look at how those scores change over time with or without the intervention. So three and the six months again. So I'll briefly present its main findings. So compared to uh, the control group, the spirit intervention group showed a significantly higher number of diets who are congruent in goals of care at the end of life, and lower patients' decisional conflict scores, and higher surrogate decision-making confidence, and as well as the composite uh, variable. So that means uh, the spirit helped these folks to prepare for end-of-life decision-making. But mostly, I was just so pleased to see the effects of the intervention on post-bereavement outcomes after the patient's death. Uh, the anxiety, uh, depression, and post-traumatic stress symptoms increased shortly after the uh, patient's death, um, understandably so. But then the intervention family members' symptom scores returned to baseline or got even low, lower by three months uh, while the control uh, scores remain higher. So that is the spirit help families move on with their life instead of ruminating and wondering, did I do the right thing? The qualitative interview data revealed uh, how the spirit intervention might have affected the end of life decision-making experiences and improved the post bereavement outcomes. So this graph shows the percentage of surrogates by four major themes we identified from the qualitative data. Many Black surrogates perceive that the spirit helped them prepare for end-of-life decision-making and actually made the decision-making easier when the time came. In contrast, a higher percentage of white surrogates reported that uh, spirit was an eye-opening experience in that uh, they got to know their uh, loved one, how their loved one felt about the illness, dialysis, and also uh, life-sustaining treatment. And their relationship got stronger after participating in the spirit intervention. Uh, there are many famous quotes from Tolstoy's Anna Karadina. And one of them is, all happy families resemble each other, but each un unhappy family is unhappy its own way. I'll slightly uh, change that. All families who experience less distress at the end of life have one thing in common. They knew their loved one's wishes ahead of time. So while uh, this efficacy trial was ongoing, um, Dr. Maureen Metzger, who was my postdoc at the time, and she and I, we pilot tested the spirit for patients with heart failure after a left ventricular assisted device. End of life decision making for people with LVAD and their families is also a complex problem in clinical settings. And luckily, we observed the consistent and positive short term outcomes of the spirit in this group of participants as well. Uh, finally, this ongoing phase three clinical trial is to examine whether the spirit will achieve the similar uh, levels of effectiveness when it's rolled out to a real world with less control over the intervention delivery. And what would uh, facilitate the translation of the intervention in clinical practice? Uh, this cluster randomized trial includes 39 dialysis clinics across four states, and we just completed uh, the recruitment and with the 470 diets. So that's almost a thousand individuals uh, to consent and manage. 
uh, in this uh, trial. And 70% uh, of them are African-Americans. In this uh, trial, SPIRT has been delivered by a trained social worker and nurse champions at the participating dialysis center as part of routine dialysis care. Um, so they have become my uh, dandelion seeds of this person. Um, I know this is not like an Academy Award or anything, but I'd like to take a moment to thank uh, the research staff that I had at the University of Pittsburgh, UNC Chapel Hill, and then uh, now at Emory. Their effort and labor uh, have been uh, crucial in this journey and cannot be taken for granted. They are the reason for my research has progressed. And secondly, I have very much appreciated the NINR's Office of End of Life and Palliative Care Research for the stability in their support over the past several years. So thank you. Okay, so back to spirit trials. Um, we came across a different challenge in preparing patients and their families for end of life decision making. Um, that is for people with a dementia and their family caregivers. Imagine a person with early stage of a dementia misplaced keys in the fridge and now frenetically searches for them. Recently, she has lost her way home three times after going for a walk. This person could be your patient, a, grand, uh, a grandparent or a grandparent. It seems that uh, people are getting less and less interested in her opinions about things, including her preferences for everyday decisions as if she doesn't have her own voice. So if she has not expressed her wishes and values before, can she articulate her end of life wishes now and do so coherently so that her family members understand them and know what to do later? Is the cognitive window of opportunity still open for her to meaningfully participate in end of life discussions with her family members? And this study was to explore that. So we enrolled 23 diets of persons with mild to moderate dementia and their uh, primary family caregivers. And 70% of the sample uh, were white and 61% had moderate dementia. And the most surrogate decision makers and primary um, family caregivers were spouses of the patients. And I'll present a couple of key findings. The intervention sessions took much longer than those with the other patient populations. That is, um, typically it would take us about 60 minutes on average, but then um, this time it took uh, 90 minutes on average, or uh, oftentimes it took much longer because there were a lot of pauses uh, by patients to gather their thoughts or come up with words and then, and yet, the interventionist was prohibited to interrupt. We um, transcribed all re uh, recorded the spirit sessions and rated the patient's level of articulation of end of life wishes. We found that uh, all patient participants were able to articulate end of life wishes and rationale uh, during the spirit session. And remember, 61% of the sample had moderate dementia. Uh, the the post-intervention data collection included questions to assess uh, patient participants' recollection of a spare session that was to um, test the feasibility of assessing the preparedness outcomes for dementia patients. Uh, since their recent memory was affected by dementia, it wasn't a surprise that a sizable number of participants had no recollection of a spirit even the day after the session. And for example, one patient said that it was about riding his bicycle. Um, one of the, the research questions we had in this pilot testing was 
identifying uh, the mental faculty that might matter most and, and therefore determine the feasibility of spirit in this population. So we look at the uh, relationships of MOCA scores assessing global cognitive functioning and UBACC scores. Uh, this is University of San Diego, a uh, brief assessment of consenting capacity. And this is screening uh, test scores. So we compare the, these scores with the levels of articulation of end of life wishes and the recollection of spirit uh, sessions. And we found that UBACC, decision-making capacity, but not the MOCA score or global cognitive functioning was significantly associated with the levels of articulation of end of life wishes. So as a next step, we are now finishing up a multi-site RCT to evaluate the preliminary efficacy of the intervention in 120 persons living with mild to moderate dementia and their family decision makers. Now, while those trials were ongoing, uh, we realized some of the unique challenges in end of life decision making for patients with end stage renal disease who also developed cognitive impairment due to uh, neurodegenerative uh, conditions. That is, how to help these patients on dialysis who also have a developed dementia and their family members to prepare for end of life decision making. So now we are currently uh, pilot testing it for this population. Um, I wanna share what study participants consistently talk to us about their experiences with the spirit. Patients said that it felt good to express my feelings and preferences. It was difficult to confront my death. Why wouldn't it be? And surrogates said that it was comprehensive, intense, and emotional. Spirit trials have sparked many uh, research ideas along the way, and uh, these are the, some of the uh, examples. Uh, assessing, uh, describing the multidimensional illness trajectories and um, decision-making about starting dialysis and also uh, measuring daily illness burden in uh, dialysis population and uh, examining informal caregiving networks in complex multiple uh, chronic conditions. In closing, um, data from these uh, spirit trials suggest that the enduring challenge may be amenable to change, but it won't be fast, simple, or easy. I'm not delusional to think that my work has made a huge impact. Uh, none of the spirit trials so far is a headline grabbing study. At best, I think I only have made a dent in the enduring problem. And that is because end of life care and treatment decision making is a, such a complex phenomenon that can be affected by numerous factors other than patient and family factors. But isn't it worth making such an effort if a spirit can help family members move on with their life after their loved one's death? So now I'd like to invite you, particularly uh, pre-docs and post-doc uh, trainees out there to join me in this effort to improve end-of-life care. My team and I have conducted many uh, SPIRT trials to develop and evaluate the intervention. Development takes time. This line of my work is a series of incremental uh, changes and long processes of continual improvement through trial after trial and uh, paying attention to the data. In fact, most innovations are incremental and there is no shortcut to decades of training and hard work. The series of spirit trials, including uh, sufficient pilot trials before larger ones were necessary uh, because 
I believe truth will sooner come out from error than confusion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Song, for sharing your research journey with us today. And as Dr. Zank mentioned, my name is Lynn Adams. I am a um, program director in the Office of End of Life and Palliative Care here at NINR, and I will be moderating the Q&A session. So I would like to now open it up for questions. And as was mentioned earlier, you may submit your questions via the live feedback form on the video cast page. So let's start. Um, our first question is how did you measure congruence with advanced care planning wishes and the care that was received? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so the, the congruence is uh, based on the likely end of life situations that the both patient and the surrogates completed. We compare the, uh, their responses uh, as a, um, to generate the congruence uh, variable uh, outcome. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is, uh, some ICU-based large clinical trials that are focused on improving family decision-maker post-bereavement outcomes have not reported significant differences in those outcomes between intervention and control groups. So what are your thoughts about why, what might have contributed to these results? Well, thank you for the question. Um, I think uh, um, conducting intervention trials in the ICU care setting may be particularly challenging because, because of the high acuity of patients and family members are already in a crisis. Um, having said that, um, my hypothesis is that perhaps the timing of the intervention uh, may be uh, trying to improve the family uh, bereavement outcomes uh, may be too late because uh, these family members are already in a crisis situation. Uh, particularly for family members um, who had not had a good end-of-life discussion with their loved ones before uh, the situation. But I'm, I'm sure there would be uh, many uh, uh, speculations uh, possible uh, for those outcomes. Okay, and so our next one, thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, you presented information on advanced care planning in individuals who are preparing for heart disease those with end-stage renal disease and those with mild to moderate dementia. And you discuss modifications, especially for those with dementia. So what other modifications were needed? What modifications would you anticipate in other populations? And which population would you most like to test spirit in next? Um, yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, I think the, as I mentioned earlier, the spirit intervention guides include prescribed questions and, and those are um, closely uh, uh, following the theoretical uh, uh, underpinnings and representational approach. So it is very uh, broad and can be easily applicable to other patient populations. But when it comes to discussing um, end of life scenarios, uh, that needs to be more specific to uh, the target patient populations and the family members. Because um, for example, um, dialysis patients, and again, um, being on dialysis for a very, very long time. So having the conversation about uh, what it's been like uh, living on dialysis and, and then have they uh, even thought about stopping dialysis and uh, heart failure with uh, um, LVAD, that's another unique situation uh, when you talk about the likely end of life situations is that um, because they already have the LVAD um, in, uh, installation, um, how, to, how to stop it? So it's not um, so much about how to, um, whether they would like to undergo uh, life-sustaining treatment, but what are the, the situations and when uh, the person, uh, patients or family members would consider stopping it. Now, um, we, my colleague and I, we are also um, a talk, a planning for this is very intervention for much larger, um, the cancer patients populations, but it may also uh, require the modifications, uh, particularly focusing on those likely uh, situations for the target uh, population. Uh, 
And additional modifications we uh, went through was, um, you know, uh, revising those language and terms used in the spirit sessions uh, so that it is uh, much more um, easier to uh, be understood by the people with a lower education uh, as well. I hope I, I answered the question. Yes, thank you. Um, and then advanced may include preferences for hospice, but how does one address hospice restrictions, Ari, when to give pain medication to alleviate unnecessary suffering? That's a very uh, challenging question. Um, now, I think that that discussion about the hospice, uh, it typically happens as a, a next step. So at the end of the spirit session, the, the clinician or the person who is facilitating the discussion uh, learns that the patients and the family member, uh, they, uh, they want more comfort care. And then that would be uh, the outcome results of the spirit session. So in terms of the, the hospice uh, care setting, unless the patients or family members specifically raises the question, uh, we don't necessarily uh, talk about this uh, hospice or other care options during the spirit session because otherwise, I mean, there are so many other uh, things that you can uh, consider discussing during this session. But then uh, we try to uh, keep it under uh, 60 minutes so that it's not just too much burdensome for both uh, clinicians and the participating patients and their family members. But uh, we pro during the, these uh, spirit trials, we provided these uh, spirit champions. Uh, what are they, the resources out there, including the hospice care facilities and they're trying to encourage them to learn more about the poly individual policies at the uh, hospice and other facilities and their organizations. Yeah, thank you. And then can you talk more about recruitment methods and how potential participants were approached? Um, well, thanks for that question. The recruitment um, has been very challenging across the whole these spirit trials because um, we, this is not something that the participants can um, be eager to participate because uh, of the subject matter. The, uh, once they uh, learn about what this project is, uh, those trials are about, people say, I'm not interested in this topic. Uh, but, you know, I think that the main, we tried several approaches, just one-on-one -on -one and in-person, um, you know, recruitment and then advertisement and also referral basis and all of that. But I think we actually uh, published a paper about recruiting participants for this type of studies against the quadruple challenges. Uh, but we learned that the most effective approach in recruitment has been uh, in person. So there is a little bit of a persuasion uh, without being coercive. And so that uh, training the research staff uh, to have that conversation with uh, potential patients and their surrogate uh, participants. And that was very critical. Thank you and a wonderful presentation. Um, as a palliative care researcher focusing in end of life decision-making and advanced care planning, you mentioned you have made a dent in the field. What are your thoughts about future needs and exploration of advanced care planning given that, as you mentioned, some feel we may need to move away from advanced care? Um, I, I think uh, the, in terms of uh, moving away from advanced directives is the over-reliance, uh, uh, not necessarily abandoning um, advanced directives. I think uh, the advanced directives or those uh, related documents can be powerful if the patient and the family members uh, had the very good uh, discussions, advanced care planning discussions uh, ahead of time. And then the document is the results of that. So I wouldn't necessarily say, um, you know, we should abandon advanced directives. I think, um, so our focus uh, continue to be uh, more on having this meaningful conversation with these patients and family members and then the complete and then complete advanced directives. 
In fact, all our uh, study participants, when we uh, looked at their post-bereavement outcomes, some of the participants had advanced directives. But when you looked at the, the difference between the intervention and control, having the, um, the document uh, ahead of time didn't make any difference. So that means really that having this meaningful conversation is the critical force to change the end of life decision making and then our family members bereavement outcomes. So thanks for taking into account that there may be differences in advanced care planning among African Americans. You may have spoken to this already, but do you feel there are disparities in this area? Definitely, yes. And I think that the particular um, we, we noticed that the differences between uh, African-Americans and white folks in terms of how they perceive this spirit intervention and how they use um, that experience for their end of life decision-making uh, and so forth. And in fact, we observed much larger effect sizes in, in those uh, study outcomes uh, in African-Americans compared to white folks. And talking about these, um, you know, end of life discussion, having this discussion um, instead of focusing on completing documents, and it it uh, may fit uh, well with uh, African Americans culture because of their emphasis on oral history. Um, so so far, the African Americans they have been really uh, appreciative of having this conversation, and and that's why we. Uh, our the investigators um, were very pleased to see the difference um, when it comes to the family uh, caregiver outcomes. And I think that the other, some larger trials in this area also observed some uh, disparity in terms of um, these meaningful conversation, its outcomes uh, between the African-Americans and the white folks. Now, the, particularly for end-stage renal disease population, because of the, the high prevalence of uh, ESRD in African-Americans, and, and yet uh, the, this population experienced high mortality because it's uh, multiple uh, chronic conditions. In other words, African-Americans are likely to experience more challenging end-of-life decision-making situations. And I think that's why. Uh, we need to encourage these folks to, uh, you know, engage in this meaningful conversation. Great. And so we have uh, many questions, but only time for one more. Uh, so I apologize. Um, thank you for this excellent work. What do you have to say about minority and indigenous populations, ways of preparing for death, dying, bereavement, grief, and loss? Um, Yes, uh, I mean, African, including African Americans, and then we also uh, try to include uh, other racial ethnic uh, groups, including uh, Latinos and Hispanics uh, as well. Now, so far, we, um, we are in the process of um, uh, modifying this spirit intervention uh, and for other language, and that is my uh, future work. Um, because it is talking about end of life issues, it's really um, culturally um, embedded. And so you have to be uh, in line with it, their cultural background and then values. Um, but again, as I mentioned earlier, the overall, uh, the questions, I mean, uh, very thought provoking questions during spirit sessions, they are very broad. And, and I suspect that they're likely to be applicable to other uh, racial and ethnic groups. But again, um, I think if there is a, such a thing, uh, precision in psychosocial or behavioral intervention, um, that is to uh, getting to learn more about your interventions um, when it's targeted for a certain population. I think that is the only way to achieve a certain level of precision. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Song, for your uh, spending time with us today, telling us about your research and answering um, all the questions we had time for. I will now hand the virtual podium back over to Dr. Zhang. Thank you, Mi Young, for that really informative lecture. And thank you, Lynn, for moderating that discussion. 
um, aligning care with people's needs is, is really important and certainly that's true at end of life. So thank you, Dr. Son, for sharing your research today and thank you to all our viewers for tuning in. Um, I hope to see many of you at the open session of NINR's Advisory Council meeting. Uh, that begins um, at the top of the hour in about nine minutes uh, at 11 o'clock Eastern. So thanks again uh, for the uh, lecture, Dr. Son, and um, see you next time.